the odds of a recession are, are more likely uh, than not, uh, but all recessions are not created equal. And in particular, there's no reason to believe right now that the slowdown in growth that the Fed is engineering uh, necessarily needs to result in uh, a severe, deep, prolonged uh, recession. Former Fed Vice Chair Richard Clarida on the considerable challenges facing the economy and markets as the Fed continues to battle inflation. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. What was the best advice investors could have gotten at the start of 2022? The answer was don't fight the Fed as it embarked upon its most aggressive tightening cycle in more than 40 years. Beginning in March, it raised the federal funds rate 25 basis points, a quarter of a percent in layman's language, and then kept hiking a cumulative four and a quarter percentage points by year end. Recognizing that rising interest rates would hurt bond prices and totally upend stock market leadership could have saved investors a lot of pain. Well, what's the best advice investors should heed in 2023? It is exactly the same. Don't fight the Fed. Just as it did when it started its tightening cycle over a year ago, Fed officials are being very clear that it intends to keep raising short-term interest rates and tapering its bond purchases until it gets the job done of bringing inflation down to its long-term target of 2%. This week's guest is an influential expert in Fed policy in practice and theory. He is Richard Clarida, Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve under Fed Chairman Jerome Powell from 2018 until 2022. He is now Global Economic Advisor at PIMCO, which he rejoined upon leaving the Fed, having worked at the bond giant in similar roles since 2006. Clarida is also a Professor of Economics and International Affairs at Columbia University. Clarity is credited with coining the phrase new neutral at PIMCO in 2014, predicting that short-term interest rates would remain lower for longer. He is also a key architect of the Fed's new policy framework of targeting an average inflation rate as opposed to a specific one, which allows the Fed to tolerate higher rates of inflation rather than preemptively raising rates to prevent it. I started the interview by asking Clarida why he is confident that the Fed will continue to tighten, or as Chair Jay Powell put it last year, keep at it until the job is done. Well, Consuelo, I think Jay Powell and the FOMC understand uh, the stakes, uh, the st and the stakes are high. I, I think certainly after the Jackson Hole speech that the chair gave uh, in August, uh, you know, he doesn't want to go down in history as the Fed chair that for squandered 40 years of, uh, of price stability. Uh, you know, history shows, especially the bad old days of the 1970s, that if the Fed lets inflation spiral out of control and inflation expectations get de-anchored, then it's very costly uh, for a long time for the economy, for jobs, for saving, for uh, investment. So I do think that they we keep at it until the job is done. And, and what's going to be the measure of success? Ideally, and ultimately, I think they want to and they will get inflation down to 2%. Uh, I, actually, I don't think that they're going to be able to get inflation down to 2% by the end of, of 2023, nor do they from their projections in the December uh, FOMC meeting. They're indicating that inflation will be lower a year from now, but still above uh, 2%. Uh, and really, only the year after that will... Uh, under appropriate policy inflation come down towards the 2% longer run uh, goal. So they're willing to take some time to get to that destination, uh, but that certainly is the, is the destination. Gee, the markets now seem to be pricing in uh, that, you know, that the Fed's made a lot of progress. There are some key inflation numbers that are coming down and the markets are pred predicting uh, that maybe a couple of modest hikes from now and then a possible, you know, cut at the end of this year. Well, I think there is a bit of a disconnect between Fed uh, communication right now and the right. uh, financial uh, markets. I think uh, they've indicated that they're going to continue to be hiking and, and they're get given every indication from recent Fed speak that we will get at least a 25 basis point hike uh, uh, on February 1st. And I would think at least another 25 basis point hike uh, in in March. Uh, 
The Fed has indicated that they've done a lot. They've raised rates at a very rapid pace uh, since last March, uh, and they know that monetary policy operates uh, with a lag. So I think at some point this spring we will see um, a, a pause. The interesting question is markets are now pricing in rate cuts at the end of the year, and the Fed's pushing back uh, against that, and I expect that to continue. Where are we in that process? I mean, how far along are we? How successful has the Fed been so far? Well, I would say so far, so far, uh, progress has not been great. Uh, this mm -hmm. is the second, well, 2020, 2022 was the second year in a row in which inflation, inflation was well above the 2% uh, right. uh, desired target. Um, and in part, I think that's due to Ukraine, the Russia invasion. Headline inflation was pushed up with oil and commodity uh, prices. Uh, but if you look at underlying measures of inflation, say wages or measures that strip out food and energy, they still were elevated throughout most of 2022. The last several months, we've begun to see some evidence that inflation has likely peaked and is coming down and will continue uh, to come down. And we'll see that in terms of, of, uh, of goods as well as, uh, as services. But, but clearly, there's a long way to go from the current level uh, of, of inflation because they want it somewhere in the twos. And right now, it's, depending on your measure, it's close to 5%. So a long way to go. Fed officials are kind of telegraphing that, you know, maybe five, five and a quarter is going to be the top of the Fed funds rate. I think the most likely outcome is getting the funds rate up to around 5%, maybe five and a quarter, maybe five uh, will be enough. But okay. uh, the stakes are high. Um, and, you know, there is, a, there is a risk that inflation remains sticky and stubborn. Um, and in particular, if that's the case, then I think the Fed may have to go uh, beyond that. But I think we're beginning to see evidence that, that a funds rate of around 5%, if they keep it there for a while, may be enough uh, to get the job uh, done. But there is some risk that they actually may have to do some more. So that's interesting. So that it's that 5% might be reasonable, might do the job, but it's going to have to stay there for a while. So there's not going to be any kind of instantaneous easing. Right. The question I know that you're getting from clients a lot is, you know, is the Fed going to have to crush the economy to get down to that 2% target? And, and you have told clients that um, averting at least a modest recession under present conditions will be challenging. So how challenging uh, is it going to be? Well, I do think the odds of a recession are, are more likely uh, than not. Uh, but all recessions are not created equal. Mm -hmm. And in particular, there's no reason to believe right now that the slowdown in growth that the Fed is engineering uh, necessarily needs to result in uh, a severe, deep, prolonged uh, recession. You know, if you go back and look, for example, at the 1990 or 2001 recession, they were they were quite mild. In fact, GDP actually grew slightly in both of those uh, recessions, and the rise in the unemployment rate was about one and a quarter, one and a half percent. So, if a year from now we're doing this interview and it turns out last year that GDP growth in 2023 was was positive and that the unemployment rate ended up somewhere in the fours, I think that would be considered uh, a pretty modest or, or, or mild uh, recession. How concerned are you about the Fed pushing interest rates, you know, too high, too fast, um, and actually doing more severe damage to the economy, as the Fed did in the opposite extreme, which was that they really eased far beyond when they should have. And as a result, we had a lot of inflation. I, th I think it's a good question because I actually think that from the Fed's point of view, and ind indeed the chair has made this point, as have other members of the committee, that the risk of doing too little to reduce inflation uh, exceed the risk of doing uh, too much. And again, uh, we have, we've gone through a period really since uh, Paul Volcker and in in, in Greenspan in which inflation in the U.S. was moderate. Uh, there was a substantial benefits to the economy, to workers, to savers, to be operating uh, in that environment. Um, and so I think that the, the Fed understands that it needs to succeed. What do you see as the most difficult trade-offs in following this tightening policy to get inflation down to 2 percent? Yes, well, I think it's right in front of us uh, in the sense that we have a very, very strong labor market now. Mm -hmm. I think by, by my estimate and others, the labor market is, is overheating right now to an extent. And so a part of the adjustment process uh, of the higher rates is going to result uh, in some increase in the unemployment rate. And obviously that's a trade-off because the Fed has a dual mandate uh, 
which is to achieve both price stability and maximum uh, employment. Uh, however, uh, the Fed also understands that the current level of unemployment, in particular two job vacancies, nearly two job vacancies for every uh, unemployed worker, is, is not a sustainable situation and certainly not consistent with price stability. So I, the way I look at it is the trade-off is that you raise rates aggressively in 2022. They probably generate a, a, a rise in unemployment in 2023 of maybe a percentage point. Uh, hopefully that, that will do the trick. Uh, but the benefits of that are re restoring price stability and locking in those benefits for a number of years, as we saw uh, in the past. So I think that really is the trade-off that, that they're facing. Is it behind the curve now, in now that inflation's a lagging indicator, we're seeing inflation basically you know, start to decline in certain areas? Should there be a pause, in other words, as opposed to more tightening? Uh, yes, and, and I think that is a risk, uh, as, yeah. as, as we discussed earlier. I right. think certainly if I were still there, it would be a risk uh, worth, uh, worth taking. Um, I do think that we will see a pause. I think we're going to see a pause sometime in the spring uh, of this year. So certainly the Powell Fed does not appear to be hell-bent to raise rates until something breaks, as sometimes okay. its critics uh, would say. And I think that the FOMC in November did begin to indicate that quite clearly in the statement to justify the pause. You know, with a bit, little bit of luck, by the time they pause, the inflation data will be sustainably coming down, and that will be a good situation for them to be in. But yes, there is some risk of, of over-tightening, but that, that's not the plan, I don't think. Is there any mistake that investors are making in their interpretation of what the Fed's doing? You know, I, I, I really don't think so as we sit here okay. right now. Um, I think last year, 2022, was a challenging year uh, in, in markets, as, as investors know. And one of the challenges last year um, is that the Fed at its March, uh, March 2022 meeting, you know, uh, laid out a, a, a pretty, um, you know, benign uh, path in terms of getting inflation to 2%. It, it had rates going up to around 3%. It never had growth falling below trend. It didn't really have unemployment rising and inflation fell. And very quickly, we did see a pivot led by the chair uh, to a much more rapid pace of increases to a much higher destination. You know, that was clearly jarring uh, in markets uh, and mm -hmm. for uh, investors. I don't really think there's a disconnect now. I think the Fed and markets are very close on, on, on very closely on the same page in terms of the level at which they will pause. There's a little bit of tension over whether or not we will see a rate cut uh, later right. in the year. I don't think it's all that much. In part, it's just because the Fed's projections of its rate path uh, are really just the most likely outcome, whereas markets are also pricing in uh, other events. Let's talk about the investment implications of what the Fed's doing for this year in the, in the financial markets. What are they? Yeah. Well, um, I'll put in a little plug. I'm back at PIMCO now. We just released our right. bonds are back uh, 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 theme uh, from our cyclical outlook. Um, and I think that's certainly an important uh, consideration. Obviously, 2022 was a was a, a, a terrible year for equity investors, bond investors, 60-40 uh, portfolios. Right. We're all aware of that. But but I think that really reflects the 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 one-off need for the Fed to get ahead of the curve to get rates real rates into positive territory. I think the rate hikes are largely uh, behind us. I think the Powell Fed. Uh, and my former colleagues will succeed in bringing inflation down to two. And so I do think in that environment, um, a lot of the rules of thumb that investors used before 2022 will become relevant again. I think you do want a diversified portfolio. I think you, you will get diversification by combining equities uh, and, and bonds. And so if there is a lesson, it is to not get too caught up in how disruptive 2022 was but to look ahead to a world in which inflation is going to be returning uh, towards the 2% goal um, and in which most of the rate hikes are uh, behind us. So bonds are back. Which bonds in particular do you think should, uh, should do well? My mom always taught me there's a silver lining behind every dark cloud. And one of the silver linings coming out of last year into this year is that starting yields that investors can earn on bonds, whether or not it's municipal bonds, treasuries, mortgage mortgages or or investment grade uh, credit uh, 
are, are, are you know, at levels last seen you know, a number of years ago. And historically, starting yield is right. a very important driver of return. So I think that's one consideration. I also believe uh, that the academic research shows uh, that an important element in long-term investor portfolios should, should have some allocation at least to inflation indexed securities. You know, for many investors, the biggest risk to their portfolio is price level risk um, and, and yields on, on tips right now uh, are also at levels that we haven't seen uh, in a long time. So I think that should be part of the allocation as well. Would that be your one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio that basically every investor should have some allocation to tips? Yep, that would be it if I had to pick one, yep. What are you doing in your job differently at PIMCO as Global Economic Advisor now than you did you know, before you got into the Fed? Well, it's early days, but I've already noticed a couple things. The first um, is uh, I'm, I'm much less focused now than I was earlier in my career about you know, you know, refining and tweaking uh, a forecast uh, for the economy and much more, much more focused on tracking the flow of data and market uh, narratives. Um, and you know, that's not unique to me. I think in general, the mm -hmm. forecasting and economics profession has moved away from uh, you know, infrequent but very, very detailed forecast towards a more holistic approach at which you're tracking the flow of, of data. And I think that that's certainly a big, a big uh, a change. Although it's really an evolution, I was already on that path, uh, I think, uh, 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 be beforehand. Uh, th the other thing uh, which, which I learned in, in particular with the various challenges uh, that we confronted during my four years at Vice Chair is, you know, something I learned in my early days as youth that I revisit, which is it's important as you're going, dealing with a project or a challenge or, or an investment uh, advice, uh, whatever it is, you know, to really think about, you know, you want to plan, uh, you want to prepare, you want to execute and you want to communicate. And I think when the Fed was at its best during my time, we really we got all four of those uh, right. And I think that's good advice. At least I try to I, I try to honor for myself uh, going forward. Right. And and as a Fed watcher, and all of us are certainly affected by what the Fed is doing. You know, very much so, especially as investors. Uh, what should we be watching? Well, I think what you want to watch is, uh, you know, compared to 30 or 40 years ago, the Fed is much more transparent. Um, their speeches, commentaries, uh, 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 testimony. If you want to cut to the chase, the one, one thing to simplify it um, is, you know, I don't think there should be any doubt about the Fed's resolved uh, about doing what it will take to, to reduce inflation and to, to restore price stability. So economists and market watchers may disagree on how rates need to get or, or how long it will take, but I think the ultimate destination is something that people should not lose sight of it, because that's going to help to guide uh, their actions and in interpreting their commentary going forward. What are you most proud of, of uh, what was accomplished during your tenure at the Fed? I'm very proud of the fact uh, that before the pandemic, I helped to put in place a policy that uh, in some ways, you know, helped to support the U.S. economy in the best position it had been in in, in decades. And inflation was right around 2 percent. The unemployment rate was at a 50-year low. Wages were going up. Uh, and indeed, the highest rate of wage gains were actually on the lowest rungs of the income distribution. And obviously, really, the, the American people and the dynamism of the American economy, of course, responsible for that. You know, but the Fed did not get in the way and did support that. And you know, at the end, that was really the longest uh, piece. That was the longest expansion we had had in recorded U.S. history, going back to the 1860s. And there was nothing wrong with the economy in January of 2020. And then, of course, you know, Act Two of my four years at the Fed was dealing with the pandemic, the shutdown, the policy response. Right. I'm very proud of of, of 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 nimbly adjusting policy to support those very good outcomes that, that we got to right before the pandemic hit. Will we ever get back to those days again, Rich? Is it possible? Well, I have, I have confidence that we'll get back there in terms of, of, of inflation. Yeah. Uh, the one thing that's the real wild card is, and it, did, it took us, took me and it took the Fed and others by surprise in 2021, there have been some very substantial changes in the U.S. labor market uh, compared to the pre-pandemic uh, 
uh, labor market and whether or not you're looking at labor force participation or you're looking um, at uh, you know job matching firms unable to fill open uh, positions right. um, um, and so um, I think I think the economy can do well but the dynamism of the economy does depend upon having uh, a robust and hopefully growing rate of labor force uh, participation um, and and that's obviously something that has not uh, returned uh, to the level that we saw uh, before and I think that's an important reason you know why the Fed is having to adjust uh, its policies uh, the way that it has. So th the question on investors' minds, if, if, if in fact we go into any sort of a, you know, a market decline again, a significant market decline, is, uh, is the Fed put alive or dead? <laughs> well, the Fed put is, uh, I think, a term that was introduced by my dear friend and, and longtime, one-time PIMCO colleague, Paul uh, McCauley. Um, and it simply refers to the fact that in past downturns, uh, both for the economy and for markets, uh, we did see the Fed stepping in to cut rates and support the economy. Um, I think that really reflected a time when the Fed was not trying to reduce uh, inflation as it is now. So, you know, right. certainly we did not see a Fed put in 2022 because the problem was that the Fed thought inflation was too uh, high. I always thought that it was a bit overstated because the way I thought about it, Consuelo, is that both, um, both financial markets uh, and the Fed are forward looking. And as the economy weakens, it's going to be bad, you know, for markets. But because the Fed wants the economy to be operating at full employment and price stability, it, it oftentimes was cutting rates in periods of weak uh, growth or financial dislocation. So, you know, the Fed put was absent in 2022 because the problem was, was high inflation. Um, and, um, you know, it may or may not return depending upon the nature of what's the shocks hitting the economy and where inflation is. What, what is it that's going to convince you that the Fed has done its job and that it, in fact, can reach a point where it could cut rates? Yeah. Excellent point, and I think that um, you know it could happen perhaps sooner uh, than than we think, uh, you know, because a lot of the indicators the Fed is focusing on now that I'm focusing on now tend to be lagging uh, indicators, right. you know, labor market and 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 wage gains. As I said, we've had three or four months now of of, of good, uh, pleasant surprises on price inflation and wage inflation. So I'll be looking at several things. I'll be looking at at uh, you know deceleration and in core inflation, if for example Zillow you know does have these 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 high frequency rent surveys, um, mm -hmm. you know if you sort of extrapolate what we've seen in the Zillow rent data for the next six or nine months, uh, I'm not predicting it, but if we were to get a continuation of those recent trends, we could see a pretty material decline in 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 uh, core inflation measures because housing is such an important part of that if we get a downward adjustment in goods prices supply chains are getting uh, un, un, untangled um, and then finally if the labor market begins to uh, return to better uh, balance uh, all those i think if they align uh, will give the fed uh, some comfort that it can uh, consider uh, rate cuts I, I think the fed will not be uh, eager to cut rates simply because declining gasoline prices reduce headline uh, inflation if the underlying drivers are still troubling. Um, but we're seeing some early signs of improvement. If that continues, uh, you know, the Fed at some point, perhaps late next year, will begin to take that seriously enough to consider uh, easing policy. And, you know, they have certainly uh, they've certainly projected that in their economic projections. They, they do have rate cuts uh, penciled in, or not penciled in, but at least projected uh, right. for, uh, for uh, 2024 and 2025. So the question is, when do those start? Mm -hmm. Well, I look for the signals from the Fed and from you, Rich Clarida, in your PIMCO viewpoints. So uh, looking forward to that day when those signals come. Thanks, Rich, for joining us so much on WealthTrack. Thank you, Consuelo. Enjoyed it. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's Action Point picks up on our discussion about the wisdom of not fighting the Fed.
Fed policy is a complicated business, which is why this week's Action Point is a recommendation to help you understand the remarkable history of modern day Fed policy while being entertained in the process. It is Reed Keeping At It, The Quest for Sound Money and Good Government by Paul Volcker. I had recommended Volcker's wonderful memoir before, but reached a greater appreciation of it when I reread it for today's interview. Keeping at it provides his invaluable personal insights into the Fed's evolution before, during, and after his long tenure there, its inner workings and decision-making processes in a very complex and dynamic world. Volcker at six feet seven in his socks was literally and figuratively a giant in finance and government. His dedication to absolute integrity and his three verities of stable prices, sound finance, and good government resonate loud and clear today. Well, next week, five-star global value manager Matthew McLennan assesses the investment risks in the U.S. markets in part one of our interview with this leading value investor. In this week's extra feature, what surprised longtime Fed watcher Rich Clarida the most when he was actually at the Fed making policy decisions? He'll tell us. Please continue to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thanks for spending time with us. Have a super weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.